This human being is a composite of the material world, that is to say the dust of the earth, but also the breath of life. So this being who holds two realities present uh, in his nature is situated in the context of scarcity. And the way in which he imprints his nature upon the world is precisely uh, in his capacity to think and to relate to the material world in ways that transcend the other material beings that exist on this planet that do not have transcendence, that is to say animals. Animals are bound to things by their instinct. Man is bound to things by his reason, by his mind. And that is what makes the human person a creative entity. That is what uh, makes the human person uh, to possess the capacity to build cultures. A beaver may build dams, but a beaver doesn't build hotels and rent out rooms to other beavers. Uh, and the, the nature of the human person is that we can not only reflect upon our existence, but we can reflect upon our reflection. And this is what makes us distinct in uh, the creation of this world. In order to accomplish this nature, in order to uh, fulfill uh, our very being, it is necessary that we have access to the material world in which we place our uh, imprint, which is to say we need to be able to exercise our reason, which requires institutions of freedom. This is why Judeo-Christianity built the institutions of freedom that came to be known as Western civilization, well, with all of its blemishes, with all of its scars, nonetheless built the rights uh, and an understanding of the rights of private property to contract eventually to uh, networks of markets where people can trade and exchange, uh, again, curtailed by a, a juridical system, a rule of law that protects uh, a society that is worthy of man himself. And what we have discussed in many instances today in, in defense of uh, the dignity of marriage, the right to life, and uh, the right to operate businesses that have our moral uh, inspiration extended through them uh, comes under the rubric of economics that uh, uh, sometimes tedious and sometimes boring uh, topic that nonetheless has such vibrancy because it expresses the call that we each of us have been given uh, to be creative. And so my panelists are going to help us to address this today, and we're going to begin uh, with uh, uh, Theodore Malik, uh, who will speak to us for approximately eight minutes. Eight minutes or less. I apologize. I have to run against the Eurostar, so I'm watching my own watch, and I'll be as quick as possible. If I speak too fast, it's only because I have to. Ponticus was a 4th century Christian monk who drafted the Logismoi, a thoughtful primer on the evil temptations that have potential to transform virtuous men into, I think I can use this word in this room, sinners. This was intended to instruct, uh, he wanted to ensure that people were aware of temptations, of vice, of the identification of their own fallibility. You might recall that Pope Gregory later, some time later, a century later, refined the list into seven, the so-called seven deadlies were established. I asked my students at Yale if they can name them, and of course they can. I hope you still can name them as pride, envy, gluttony, lust, wrath, sloth, and greed. I argue in my most recent book that these also have an economic character, and in fact, all seven of those visit us in this latest financial collapse. If you fast forward, and we have done that in, the, in this room already today, uh, fast forward to our postmodern, or some of you are calling it, I guess now, and I like the term better, post-secular culture, that's a hopeful term, where the public vocabulary is no longer keenly aware of the teachings of the past, certainly of the vices of the past, or the virtues of the past. On a worldwide cultural level, I would say, in Europe and America both, we lack the urgency to maintain consistent standards of virtue and ethics, and that's particularly the case in the realm of economics. My MBA students, some of the best and brightest people on the planet, actually in courses even on business ethics, cannot answer the question of what is virtue. They don't have a clue. Unfortunately, this is also increasingly true of CEOs. They seem to know a lot more about vices. 
thanks to trash or TV shows that watch films to damage of everyday life, they generally still do see something slightly wrong with fraud, Ponzi schemes, with theft, with cheating, but they can't quite put their finger on why. So there have been a number of recent surveys, and they show that people, frankly, all people across all ages, all categories, don't mind a little lying or a little cheating or a little stealing. It's accepted, in other words, in order to, as this quotation goes, because everyone does it anyway. So my research, my recent research, is about how we have lost virtue in our society, particularly in our economic cultures, why it matters, what the arc of trust provides in markets, as well as a closer look. And I think we have to look at these in the grainy detail. The worst of the worst companies coming out of the financial crisis. This is particularly too true in the financial services industry. What can we learn from these failures? It's not just about a glass that's half empty. I think it is half empty. But it's also about, and we talked about this in the, the keynote session this morning, about refilling the glass. That is the core of the argument. Without all of our diligent efforts, all of our personal efforts, all of our corporate efforts, all of our cultural and societal efforts, and I count in that group particularly business schools which have done a particularly bad job, we will fall further into an abyss. It's about restoring the radius of trust. Trust is underlying many of these conversations, I think. Overcoming Daniel Bell's thesis about the cultural contradictions of capitalism, and regaining what the brilliant Wilhelm Brophy, a Christian economist of the 1950s, argued in a seminal work, The Humane Economy, namely the fact that without honesty and trust, the market itself, the free market, degenerates. And our economy, which is now global in nature, spins out of control. So almost anyone can write a telltale about Wall Street greed and corruption. There are probably two dozen books on the topic. But in the aftermath of the very worst financial crisis since the Great Depression, there have not been many seminal works that comprehensively address the systematic root causes of our worldwide recession that have had such a, a, a profound domino effect worldwide on public unrest, grassroots political movements, on all these legislative Dodd-Frank type reforms and government agency audits, with frankly the general disgust everywhere with finance, with Wall Street, and I would argue, particularly in our younger audience, with corporations in general, this is a problem. The groundswell of public anger is maybe unprecedented, maybe extraordinary, not since the Vietnam War have we seen it to such a degree. I wouldn't blame only the Wall Street criminals, certainly the lots of blame to spread around here, but I'm saying that there's something structurally wrong with our entire system, with our culture, with our ethical notions as a society. We have, in fact, lost our original moorings and morphed into a kind of managerial, some are calling it a crony capitalism, where managers routinely loot their firms without reprisal, without prosecution. And I think we have to actually say that there are bad parts of capitalism so that we can point out the good parts of capitalism. Defects in our moral, in our societal moral fabric that produce financial swindlers, perhaps more evident than ever before. Think of Bernie Madoff. You know, that's an American phenomenon. He stole, in fact, not just billions, but $65 billion from everyday people, mostly Jewish people. He was an anti-Semite, even though he was Jewish, as if it was a standard business process to do so. CEOs such as John Corzine, Bob Diamond, Jimmy McCain, Dick Fold, you might know those names, presided over the demise of very proud international banking institutions. They allowed, and here's my metaphor, drug-like addictions to boom or bust synthetic derivatives to over-leverage, 50 to 1 in some cases, marginalizing risk management procedures, which ultimately resulted in the proverbial overdose, the destruction of their own company. Others, such as Tyco CEO Dennis Kozlowski, World Time CEO Bernie Ebers, tragically obsessed with retaining power, keeping their gravy train of profits moving. They lied. They lied to investors. They lied to the market by inflating and falsifying financial statements. These collapses, scandals, and crimes demonstrate an ethical, an ethical decay that we rarely seen before 
in global history, even though we've had bubbles. Ethics, frankly, has been dumbed down to mean merely compliance. And that's a problem. Now, in, in many of these circles, the, the idea is still circulating that you won't get caught. I'm arguing in the long run you always get caught. That our prior formal sets, and many of those were embedded in the Judeo-Christian tradition, our sets of ethics are absolutely critical to business virtue, no longer hold the sway that they once held. Today's corporate cultures, more and more CEOs increasingly encouraging oriented behavior that produces short-term results, supposedly satisfying shareholders and boosting the stock price in the process. That is bad capitalism. That is not the kind of moral capitalism some of us would like to see practice. The short-termism is at the very root of our problem, causing what I call the end of ethics. Leaders focus on results now, on the health the consequences of any lingering ethical qualms about how we got here. They focus on maximizing performance and immediate reward. This quarter, not over the next 10 quarters, and certainly not over the next 10 years, which is what they should be doing. The mantra abandons any real sense of enterprise risk management, corporate reputation, which is almost gone completely, or durable, sustainable reward throws responsibility, in a word we've used in this room already this morning, character under the bus. The theme is like the nefarious characters, and again made up as the poster boy here, more and more companies are willing, ready, without a compass, without a rudder, to do almost anything for gain's sake. So we need to find a way to recover, and my recommendations have to do, in the first instance, with personal character, personal responsibility, Secondly, focusing on corporate cultures of integrity, and then finally, and lastly, not firstly, on regulatory regimes. Thank you so much. I was looking forward to the, uh, the cards I've been hearing about all day, but saw nothing, so I had to take it into my own hands. Oh, I, I need some reinforcement. Thank you very much, Mr. Mellon. European social model? My answer is yes and no. Yes, if you look at the European Union, covering 28 EU member states for already 50 years, mainly focused on economic cooperation. But also no, because of the great variety of the economies of the European countries. But leaving aside all these different differences, within the European social model, you may say the free market is more or less constrained by various institutions and regulations. Most European countries value consensus, collective success, and concern for the long term. On the contrary, the Anglo-American model puts greater emphasis on individual success, financial gain, and has a more focus on the short term. But does the Anglo-American model offer more freedom? And does the European model offer more justice? The answer to this question depends on what you mean by freedom and by justice. For a historical perspective, I go back to the Middle Ages, very short. Then we have the feudal powers, the production of craft goods was regulated by the guilds, and until 1688, the glorious revolution in England, and that was the turning point for the road to a greater economic freedom power of the king was reduced and political rights were the key to protect economic rights. In France, the Catholic Church was far more powerful, so it took uh, more than 100 years before their guilds were abolished. 1791, the government had to give way to the free market there. The Industrial Revolution then developed for more and more from the second half of the 18th century. 
And the, the main difference is here that the separation of home and work that makes a huge economic expansion possible. That's the big merit, I think, of the capitalist system. At the same time, the social consequences uh, of the industrial revolution were disastrous. Depopulation of the countryside, economic oppression of, and exploitation of workers, child labor, living conditions were very bad, especially in cities. So, this gave two reactions. First, Karl Marx, we know him, who did strive against capitalism and advocated a class struggle between poor laborers and wealthy citizens, the bourgeois. The other response came from the Catholic and Protestant churches. They didn't want a struggle between classes, but they favored uh, a cooperation between labor and capital. Therefore, in the course of the 20th century, we see a moderate form of capitalism is established in most European countries. The empirical of the free market is constrained by law, for instance, labor law, progressive, progressive taxation, social security and pension systems. But all this went too far. The government wanted to regulate almost everything, and people more and more got unwillingly to pay more taxes. People and enterprises were hindered by bureaucracy. They judged the state not any longer as a protector of the poor, but as a parasite, as a mild, as a millstone. Social security is not any longer considered as a sign of social progress, but as an incentive to do nothing and still take advantage, advantage of the community. Will this be the end of the European social model? In my opinion, the tide will turn. No one wants to go back to the rough times of the Industrial Revolution. But how can we get out of the dilemma of the powerful state versus the free market? I think we must avoid two extremes. On the one hand, the equality trap of social welfare, in which every citizen has equal right to health care and financial support when needed. On the other hand, we must also avoid the trap of unstrained expansion. Personally, I don't believe that making profit is the highest priority of an enterprise. Neither do I believe that gaining more wealth is the utmost destiny of a human being. But what's the alternative? Where do we strive for? I have five points. Firstly, go back to the fundamental idea of Catholic and Protestant churches, the partnership between capital and labor. Nowadays, we see that shareholders consider the company as an instrument to, to pursue maximum profits for their own benefits. They don't take into account the interest of employees and customers, for instance. However, a partnership between shareholders, employees and customers will orientate on the con continuity of the company. That will prove to be more fruitful in the long term. Secondly, it's important to recognize the relationship between political freedom and economical freedom. Why did the communist system fail? Because there was no political freedom and consequently no room for economic experiments and innovation. Third, we don't want state socialism nor market fundamentalism. I wholeheartedly recommend a form of moderate capitalism, that's to say a market plus model, where neither the state nor the free market has absolute power but where the orientation is public justice. To achieve this, we must have strong institutions and distinctive legislation. Finally, again the question. What is justice? Or, with the biblical word, what is righteousness? We always have to keep in mind that righteousness is a relational concept, as the same with freedom. How do we treat other people? As the Bible says, love one another as you love yourselves. How much freedom do we allow other people? We cherish the freedom and the responsibility of every person to care for his or her beloved ones. I believe that the family therefore is the cornerstone of the society. With a social institution, children and grown-ups can learn about responsibility and solidarity. Justice and freedom belong together. One can't exist without the other. Therefore, if we strive for sustainable freedom, we also strive for social justice.
Welsh is next. Thank you. I am the last speaker, right? So uh, my wish, my prayer that the last will be the first. <laughs> <laughs> and I was wondering why people uh, the, uh, I was invited here because the topic was about responsibility. And I am an economist, and uh, I also have an interest in, uh, in moral issues. And I will change my thinking because that to based on what you said. That we have to deal with many forms of scarcity. And economics is all about managing scarcity. This is actually the real meaning of economics, is to provide solutions to manage scarcity. And scarcity has changed over the years. 40 years ago, capital was scarce. And eventually, we invented financial capitalism. Today, financial capital is no longer scarce anymore. It's overabundant. But we have new forms of scarcity. People, natural resources, talent, ideas, moral, ethics. We are lacking ethics. And it's good. Scarcity is good, it's a blessing. It's good, I repeat that, it's good. Because it forces us to be in a relationship with those who have. If I don't have, and you have, I have an interest in building a relationship with you. But the way you build a relationship is based on the way I like to go back to the uh, question I was asked, based on a, a response or not, just for responsibility. And since we are talking about Julio Christian's uh, ethics here, uh, it's good sometimes just to, uh, I will use an expression that is uh, common among the uh, Jewish people. It's good to shake the uh, coat of the rabbi. Yeah, just to shake it a bit. Say, rabbi, what do you have to say? And the concept of responsibility in Hebrew comes to the word ashayarut, which means the other. Okay, so when you are responsible, in the biblical the Jewish in the word, it means that the other needs to be right in the middle of the equation. A second concept which came to my mind just when I was talking about this concept of tikkut olam, which means in Hebrew, the human shared responsibility to heal, to repair, and to transform the world. To heal, to repair, and to transform the world. And it goes back to the teaching of Jesus. Jesus came to heal the sick. And we are sick. We human beings are sick. The relationships are sick. The marriage, the families are sick. And the economy is sick. And we have a responsibility to, I would say, maybe shake the coach of the people of God. To ask them what it means to hear the economy. Because today, if you look at the, uh, in the, at the Judeo Christian tradition, and I come from France, I, I work as a chief economist in an American company, and I can see actually the, the different ways of running this form of scarcity. The, the Judeo Christians have put the individual at the center of everything. In a sense, in many senses, the individual has replaced God. And in the American system, we talk about free market. Free of what? Okay. I, I, I remember a few days ago, the book talked about the tyranny of money, the tyranny of market. It's, uh, it's a deceiving concept. The market and the free. They are, they, are, they are slaves of money. They are slaves of greed. And the uh, European invented this concept of welfare states. Okay. Welfare, not a lot. Okay. So in a sense, you have the free market solution which is all about worshipping money, and you have the welfare state which is all about replacing God with a welfare state. So two false gods. Two false gods. And when you worship the false god, you, you inevitably you end up in a, in a situation of instability and disequilibrium and scarcity. But we as human beings, we have received an immense blessing, which is the ability to heal, to repair, and to seek, and, and, to, and to transform the world. And this is what drives me. As a, I know because 
that time, but as a person of the stimuli, I've been working for seven years on a model inspired from this concept to provide a, a new definition to value creation. At the moment, the economy is based on capital gains. God wants to create value. And we have to start small. And again, the solution will not come from big people or big organizations. It could come from people like you and I. Because the gospel says, if you are faithful with a few things, you will be given authority on greater things. So I just like to leave you with uh, Mr. Hope, right? The solution is in shaking the mental code of the people who have knowledge of God, the rabbis and the people of God. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, original, uh, original family. And again, it was a form of redistribution. So the idea that remuneration is, is important, I mean, it's part of a, of a system in a sense, but you cannot accumulate uh, remuneration without limits. You can't. So every generation, you have to find a way to redistribute uh, in proportion of uh, population. So in, in other words, there is, uh, so there is, there is the reason here is that remuneration it works only within a limited amount of time. But it is the same concept of remuneration. It is rest, redistribution, shadow, shadow. And this is providing peace, and this is also providing prosperity. And this is where you can make a difference between capital gain and, um, and added value. I just want to finish with one thing, just to give you a... When I look at the, uh, at the Federal Bank, uh, Monetary Policy, and also the other uh, federal banks, these days uh, the Fed injects uh, 85 million of dollars every month into the system, which amounts to about uh, 1,000 billion of dollars every year. The GDP of the US is roughly 15,000 uh, billion of dollars. Basically, we inject 8% uh, into uh, the, the system every, uh, every year. And the economy grows by, what, 2%? So we are already in recession. Okay, so the, the, the form of remuneration that we have, which is the, the financial remuneration, is no longer valid. We have to find other ways of uh, of describing the value it creates. It can't be only really value. I'm tempted to follow this conversation, but I know that other people want to get involved. Uh, Father Beers. Uh, my question is for Monsieur Roche. Uh, I was so hoping to hear someone address the recent words of Pope Francis regarding capitalism. It reminds me, and I wanted to address this question to Dr. Tivioni earlier, it reminds me of John Paul's uh, interview in Messagero 20 years ago when he distinguished savage capitalism from capitalism. Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, my hope is, and I haven't seen the original text of Pope's words, uh, is he making allowance for a benevolent mm -hmm. capitalism, which I saw in John Paul's words 20 years ago as distinct from a savage capitalism? Okay, well, this is uh, a good uh, something which, which uh, strikes me, and I'm traveling the world, that the concept of um, the dimension of entrepreneurship uh, is, is in, the, uh, in the DNA of, uh, of every culture and every human being. So entrepreneurship is part of what, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way to describe human beings. And eventually, capitalism is a form of economic model that frames entrepreneurship. And some culture are more conducive than other to the entrepreneurship spirit. And but these days, uh, my view is that the free market, the way it is organized, and the welfare state, the way it is organized, are no longer conducive to entrepreneurship because they are focusing on capital gains, not value creation, or they are focusing on providing some sort of artificial support to uh, and with, without fostering entrepreneurship. So I would make, I think uh, capitalism is fine, I mean, uh, as long as it is a system that is conducive to the entrepreneurship. And it, these days, for instance, the microfinance institutions are there, for instance, to find a way to unlock the entrepreneurship spirits in, um, in, in poor countries. It's, uh, okay, it's one, one out of many, but it's probably the most, most known. So, we, as human being, we are entrepreneurs. I mean, uh, we like to create. We, uh, God is creator. So we are in the image of God, so we are creators. And therefore, uh, it's important to develop a system, a framework around entrepreneurship that promotes this concept. But today, my view is that the two approaches that we talked about, welfare state and the market, are in a sense distorting this 
because it's based on greed and it's based on the worship of a false god. Wouldn't the enhancement of um, competition go a long way to remedying exactly the problems you, you identified? In other words, uh, by, by the deregulation of markets, allowing entrepreneurship to blossom, and by, by, um, by competition, I'm referring to you now to planning of society over the whole of society rather than in pockets by uh, trade unions or, or bureaucracies or legislation. Wouldn't that foster a renaissance of entrepreneurship? Because I, I agree with you. That there, uh, now, in the United States, it would be different because we have a great number of small businesses. It's the, the better part of, of our growth in the United States. I think I'm the wrong person to have moderated this panel because I want to get into the discussion. My boss, my boss, my boss keeps telling me, because I'm Frank and he's American, he keeps telling me that actually uh, the French businessmen are the best of the world because it's so difficult to uh, create a business in France that the one who succeeds in doing that, <laughs> they are the best businessmen in the world. Well, being a businessman in the US is very easy. <laughs> it's much more difficult to be a businessman in France. But the concept of competition is okay, but again, uh, it is uh, what I like about the biblical principle of Jubilee is that every generation will reset the rules. And the idea that you have, in a sense, is also the biblical principle that you have to be faithful in your own generation. My father is an artist. I'm glad I didn't have a business. Because if I had a business, I, I, maybe I would have had to run this business. And I have no talent for art. So when you have a business and you give, Ask your, uh, your uh, the next generation to run your own business. It could be disaster. Hi. Hi. Oh, yeah. 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 Federico from the uh, Schumann Center for European Studies. Um, I've read, or I've heard not a long time ago, um, uh, from a book uh, written by Jonathan Sachs, um, who's comparing the Israelite society, who was based on a covenant compared to nowadays society is based on contract. So contract society is, I establish a contract with you, you're going to do that, that job. If the contract is not respected, you, you've taken out, uh, or then at the end of the contract you stop. Where the covenant is we're together, whatever happens. Um, don't you think that the covenant society nowadays uh, would uh, somehow put the safeguard for, for this free market, a free market in the context of a, a covenant society, would, would it be uh, something that is possible? Thank you. I think you uh, made a good remark because a contract you can immediately uh, end it, so you can break the relationship, but the covenant is not breakable, you can't end the covenant. Because God promises, enduring promises. So um, uh, the problem, like I think, of uh, the uh, savage capitalism or the root capitalism is that it has nothing to do with uh, cherished relationships between enterprises, between businessmen, between people, between uh, employees and employers, and so on. So I think we have to. Um, uh, repair capitalism on this point. So, um, for instance, uh, business families are far more better in looking on the continu continuity of the enterprise or the long term. And not the, the shareholders company is only looking for maximizing the shareholders growth, for instance. So, I think there's something we have to keep in mind and to, uh, to uh, incorporate in our view on the capitalism. Yes? Yes. Uh, I have a question. I'm going to come to this uh, lady here who's been waiting for some time. Go ahead. So I have a question for the panelists. It's regarding the, the crisis of 2008. I was wondering if the cause of the crisis was the ruling relativism in, in the West, considering that this crisis was hitting the West, Europe and the States, and most of the uh, bankers or people involved in all the uh, wrongdoings with the mortgages and with the toxic products were people who were born in 
a society where there was not concept of right or wrong. So at the end, these people were just reflect of society, which perhaps is leading to the, uh, to the end in these last 20 years because of this lack of principles, right or wrong. Thank you. Um, he's, he, the question was, and correct me if I'm wrong, that given that the, um, uh, the crisis emanates from a society that is, uh, has embraced moral relativism, that, that, that the sense of right and wrong has been diminished, could this be the, the cause of the, the roots of the crisis? It's not the financial system. Not the financial system. But the, the moral formation or lack thereof. I think I think well, I agree because um, I think the free market is a coordination mechanism. It's not right or wrong. It depends on the people that do wrong things within the market or do the right right things in the market. Um, what we have done wrong, for instance, is accumulating loans. So then we will become slaves from our money because we have to pay back. Uh, and we can't pay back, so then yeah, we, have, we have a huge problem within society. Um, so therefore, it is wise uh, to have a maximum capacity of, of uh, for instance, a uh, loan on your home or, or, or on your credit card, or for instance, um, depending on how much your income is. So in that way, we have to, um, um, to rethink what well, each concept of, of right and wrong within, also within the economic context. And we have ruled out ethics from economics. That was uh, what my fellow uh, speaker, Tetmanik, also argued about. So. But there's also this concept of the covenant, which actually, uh, the covenant is actually uh, just the opposite of, uh, of relativism. The covenant is unconditional. And uh, first of all, in the, in, in the covenant, people first, the land second, the land the money third. This is the way uh, value should be created and value should be remunerated. If you change the order, which is why they money first, people second, and planet at the very end, then over all of a sudden you create a system which is uh, uh, in disequilibrium. Secondly, as you say that uh, capital, when you come to the word capital, the number of head, and actually in, a, in Gave in France the word chattel, which is the number of livestock. It's the real number of, uh, of heads of, in, a, in, in a livestock. So capital was not meant to be to accumulate without limit. It was meant to serve as a tool to provide liquidity to the system. The minute money becomes a unit of accumulation, you're changing the uh, definition, the uh, semantic of the word, and it's changing value, it's in value. And what we've seen in the last 20 years, uh, money became a unit of accumulation and no longer a unit of transaction, and it's losing its value, as we speak. So personally, I don't invest any more in, uh, in uh, financial instruments at all. Today, the Fed prints money. Today, the Fed prints money. Yes, I will try my best with English. Please, I apologize. Okay. No, no, I will try my best. <laughs> Thank you for your compassion. Uh, well, you know, the French Revolution was actually dictated by mathematicians. That's why the French president for the trial, recess trial, was selected by only one reason. He was a mathematician. Did you know that? And he was the one to invent the calcul de probabilité, a very strange way. He was in the Prokop Revolutionary Restaurant, and it was always full. So he asked the Lord the owner, please, how do you manage to be so successful? And he said, I always overbook. So today, you speak of economy and morals on ethical and human scale grounds. For me, actually, it's completely out of our reach because the French school, Polytechnique, is one to um, set a frame on logiciel, server, that are completely out of human understanding and reach. 
So today, only two companies in the world are able to, to set the real actual price of a share because the formula is just so expensive that you just select the best students of the French Polytechnic School. As you know, Chinese students now are selected for that special class. So, well, we should speak of morals, but we should also revise, as Mr. Malop says, business school teaching. Thank you. Yeah, and this is, this is what you, you said two things here, which I think to me are, are critical. First of all, it's really pity to, uh, to observe that the best brain in the world, not only in France, but all over the world, go to finance. What a waste. I wish they, I wish they, they went to uh, the pharmaceutical industry. They would create the next vaccine for the next car or whatever. This is really a shame. Second thing is, what do you do with that? And I think the, the teaching of the next generation is critically important. And I'm not sure, I, with, with what we do at the moment, uh, with my team and the people around me, we can change my peers. But I really, I really want to change or influence the next generation by providing a new, form of, I mean, a new curriculum for the MBA, the MBA schools. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. Hmm. But there's a time for everything. We have time for uh, one more question. My name is Michael van der Most. I'm from Cloud for Life Association in the Netherlands. And thinking of the Netherlands, I'm thinking of Santa Claus and Santa Piet, Black Peter. And I'd like to say something about the discussions this morning because Black Peter was black because he climbed down the chimneys, putting parcels in shoes of the children, climbed up again to St. Nicholas, who was on the roofs of the houses and continuing over the roofs on his horse to the next house. And that's why Black Peter is black. And we are in that discussion because we forgot the history. What I've also heard today is that we have done away with our crucifix in our Catholic schools, in our Protestant church. We are taking away religion out of our societies. The same thing was done by Adolf Hitler when he came to power. He took down the uh, crucifix and placed it by his portrait. Uh, he was uh, a totalitarian guy, as we know. He was a national socialist. When we're talking now about uh, our jobs, economics, and that sort of thing, uh, our firm will say, you are too expensive, we'll go over to India. Uh, when we're talking about that, we're talking about globalism. When we're talking about the uh, pro-life issues, we see that the pro-life issues are under, uh, under uh, attack all over the nation, all over the world, all over the globe, especially now in South African countries. Uh, so what I'd like to round up this thing is, how can we sustain freedom in a growing, globalized world, which I would like to refer that to not as national socialism, but as international socialism. Yes. To me, the, I would just react to one point. Um, it's not the cost of labor that is a problem today, it's the cost of capital. Capital is too expensive. Not labor. Well, I'm glad that we've come back to the, the theme of what uh, sustains this freedom. And we've had some rich discussion all day long uh, on this, and including on this uh, panel. Uh, I think that um, certainly we, we've seen here in our brief discussion the various definitions of what we mean by market economies, controlled economies, uh, morally inspired economies, competitive economies. 
economies, free economies, quasi-free economies. So I think this is one of the takeaways for us to perhaps more clearly define what we're speaking about, even, even the discussion we've had here about what the cause of the crisis is somewhat confused because let's remember that the moral hazard of which we've all spoken during the crisis is not a, a theological term. It's a term that comes to us from economics. It's a term that speaks to us about the asymmetry of knowledge so that actors in a market are kind of blindfolded in terms of what their investments go for uh, by the protective uh, guarantees that were offered in the case of the crisis of Freddie Mac, uh, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. So uh, I think this really causes us to, and even the criticisms that the Pope uh, has offered, including the ambiguities of this criticism. I have a lot of questions about what he was saying along the lines of what Father Beer said. What, what do we mean? Where is this free, unhampered market? Uh, uh, where are these actors who have no moral reference point? Uh, uh, point them out to us. And I mean, here, voluntarily, uh, each address the moral dimension uh, of this uh, uh, issue. So we, we take away a, a great deal. Of, uh, perhaps we, we walk away with more questions than answers, uh, which is a sign, I think, of a good and intellectually provocative uh, experience together. So I thank you very much, and I invite now Hank Jan van Schoenhorst. I'm sorry <laughs> for my, my pronunciation, who uh, is also one of the great animators of, of our conference today, to come and give us this closing. Poverty Cure. It's a it's a series, a, a documentary series on how to help, uh, how to enable the poor to rise out of poverty through their own knowledge and uh, uh, capacity. So this was presented to the Holy Father a month ago. And given the uh, apostolic exhortation I read uh, last week, I don't think he's gotten around to viewing it. <laughs>